And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, this next workshop is going to be with Alan Zakowski, who's going to be presenting on uh, securing agile development. Um, Alan, as you can see, has multiple certifications and is currently the CEO and principal consultant for Positech LLC. Uh, he initially began his career in the U.S. Army, field testing and operating the uh, initial system that was a precursor to our mobile uh, phone system and wireless network with the Omni Mobile Subscriber Equipment. And today's discussion, as I said, will be about security Thank you. Thank you for the applause. We'll see if I survive and earn it. Uh, thanks, first of all, for being here for lunchtime, at lunchtime, because I knew you guys could be eating. Um, a couple things up front, just real quick. Uh, this doesn't allow me to see my notes, so there is a real risk that I will repeat myself. Um, and I try not to do that, but it's going to happen. All right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Scrum and injecting security. I've been working with a number of organizations over the last few years. Basically, uh, the conversation goes like this. Hey, we have agile development. They're out doing this thing. We have no idea what's going on. Security things are happening. What do we do? Help us, type thing. So this is basically the methodology or the framework that uh, I've been using that's helped some of these organizations basically get involved with Scrum and uh, from a security perspective. Um, you can't see the picture real well, but in the background, last February I was in Vietnam and I took a picture and there was like literally a hundred people on motor scooters that it's just absolute chaos. But the thing that reminded me of Scrum about that is that they're all going somewhere and they're all coming down the street. So even though they're all moving in different directions and there's cars weaving in and out and stuff like that, and I apologize that this didn't come out, um, everybody's moving forward. And so that kind of, yeah, it was a visual for me um, on how Scrum works. And I think this, I go this way. I go that way. All right, I'll do this. So let me ask some questions. Uh, first of all, how many developers do I have? All right. Security people. Security people that were basically told the same story I was. Hey, these agile guys are going all over the place. Help me out. All right. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully you'll get some uh, information that you can use here. Which I figure out how this thing works. Not that one's not that one's not that one. Okay. So I may do drawings. Uh, <laughs> no, I've got nothing. Good job. They haven't implemented that feature yet. <laughs> right. It's in the backlog. <laughs> this is the MPP. Have you tried turning it off at all? You reboot it, right? This is a slideshow. Oh, yeah. slide Can I just hit this button, maybe? No? That would make too much sense. All right. We might all get to see my notes because I don't know that I'm going to be able to run for that. All right. Slideshow. Touch full view. All right. Slideshow at the top. Yeah, but the slideshow at the top won't let me advance. So we're going to do it then. All right, and talk about anyone being a developer. Uh, so the objective, my objective here is, uh, and some of you might rec recognize this format. As the presenter, I want to discuss my experience with injecting security into agile development, Scrum, so that the participant can start having discussions at your organization about integrating security into your Scrum programs. Why does that look familiar? That's a user story. And if you're going, to, if you're in security and you're just getting a feel for um, for agile and Scrum, 
know this format. I, as a something, would like to do something so that something happens. Okay? And it's not uncommon to say, hey, can I get the, um, can I get the information about the system? Can I get your run books? Can I get your, um, uh, all the data about this system? And they'll go, yeah, go to Rally, and all the stories are in there. And that's it. So you're not going to find, you know, there's a lot of cases where you're not going to find a lot of information that tells you technical data because this is as far as it goes. All right, so a little history by, behind Scrum. Uh, it's inspired by lean production methods. Was first The term was first coined for production systems in Japan in 1987. Um, and I'm not going to try to, to pronounce the gentleman's name. Uh, developed by Ken Schwebler, Schwaber, I'm sorry, and Jeff Sutherland. Uh, and it was first documented in a book called Agile Software Development in 2001. And this is the Agile Manifesto. Uh, and this is also important to know. Uh, what it says here is that uh, we are uncovering better ways of development. It's really hard for me to read on here and there. Um, by doing it and helping others to do it through this work, we have come to value individual and interactions over. Now, this is what's important, and this is what a pure Agile development people and Scrum Masters and that sort of thing will 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 pull out a lot. Individual interactions over, over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation, which is why they'll go, hey, it's all in Rally, well, all stories read them. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Uh, this, th that's a bear, by the way, and that's a whole nother presentation, maybe next year. Uh, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. The one thing I would point out about that is that while there is value, we value one more. That doesn't mean the other things go away. And a lot of times when you deal with scrum masters and you deal with product owners, there is a belief that that other stuff goes away. And that's not true. All right. So here are the 12 principles. Uh, I'm not going to read them uh, to you, but I am going to ask some questions in regard to this um, for some of you who are dealing with this now. What are the issues that you're, with, that you're dealing with? Because I want this to be a little bit more interactive than me just stand up here and point at stuff. Yes, sir. I was just going to ask, if, if, you, if you could include some of the top tips to get senior management to look at return on investment of security, versus the business value that they're trying to get out of each of these MBIs or MTIs that they, that they own. All right. Because, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, why they value Scrum. Value proposition. <clears throat> but getting work prioritized for security is difficult at best. Yep, yep. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, and that's a tough nut to crack. Um, but I can tell you how I've done it, and uh, and hopefully it helps out. Value preposition of security, and I don't want to say versus, but we'll put versus Scrum. Anything else? I want to make sure that I answer these questions before I leave here. Well, as a general case, let's say in an architecture review, you need documentation to review. Yeah. So that's think. kind of a little bit, the weight is more on doing than documenting. So they're managing that all conflict, but the manifesto. Yeah. Um, and there are some new things that are out there. Safe is one of them and that sort of thing. There's a little bit more on documentation. Uh, however, I'm not too uh, versed in that. But from what I've seen, security is still not mentioned. It's not. Speed market versus yeah, security market. Speed market. Speed market versus uh, security is slowing it down. Right. That's what we want to do. You're getting in our way. Oh. Yeah. No. Security. Well, I mean, how how fast do you need to be going? How fast do you want to be going when the train wrecks? How fast do you want to get to that breach? 
How quickly do you want to see your name in the paper? <laughs> and that's what we generally tell them. It's yeah, it's well, a risk there's that there's you no have to accept. Yeah, and and I don't want to, you know. Uh, so everyone goes, well, you really can't do the fear mongering thing, right? Um, and you should avoid that. And and I agree to that to some extent, but there is the reality. Okay. Uh, anything else? Yes, sir. So, well, we spent a lot. Well, maybe. Better, I would say, generally, I've seen a lot of better to ask for forgiveness and to ask for permission. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, uh, and you know what? Um, that is always a challenge. Do, then ask. You want to be cool. Uh, all right, so there's the coolness factor. We're cutting edge. This is a good one. Um, and, and what it leads to, honestly, is a lot of times, if you actually read uh, a Scrum book, and let me just jump down to it real quick. If you actually read this book, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is actually addressed in there. And somewhere along the way, it has been discarded for expedience. Um, because there's a lot of stuff in there about processes, and a lot of the things that we're talking about here are, like I said, they're addressed, and there's no real mention of, hey, discard these things. One of the things that happen when you do uh, Scrum Master training, and I am, I'm, I'm a certified Scrum Master, is they assume that when you have these discussions that you're in a greenfield development. You can do whatever you want. Okay, there's no restrictions. I'm going to give you a user story and I just want you to make it happen. And they don't talk about things like, oh, we're a Microsoft shop versus a Linux shop. And the overhead that's required for Microsoft machines over Linux. Okay, uh, they don't talk about those things. Because that's not Scrum. Scrum is, I can do whatever I want. What do you mean there are restrictions? Okay? And so that's an educational process, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. I think you had a question. Uh, I was just going to put up another uh, issue that I have that is, as a developer, engaging other departments to be involved in the Agile process, mm -hmm. getting people to understand that the Agile process works for many more things than just developing. Yeah, um... So I'm going to say getting, see if I capture this. Other departments to really buy in to Agile. All right? Did I capture that pretty good? All right. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a sticky subject in my mind, uh, and we'll go into that a little bit, only because I've seen people try to do Agile for um, infrastructure. I've never seen them do it well. Uh, they do what they call spins as opposed to the sprints. Uh, we're going to stand up this many VMs and this spin, we're going to do this, that, and the other thing in this spin, um, and, and it's hard for a lot of people to get their heads around, and it's, it's again, that'll be a subject at some other point, I guess. All right, any other ones before I continue on? All right, uh, my screen went dead, so we'll use this now. All right, so uh, I think it was on, all right, so we talked about the history. So it was based on lean manufacturing, okay? Uh, so we're talking about Duran, we're talking about um, uh, Deming. Um, and constant iterations. What gets lost, though, is that it's about process improvement, it's about product improvement in iteration, but people lose sight of the process improvement that goes along with it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. All right, we talked about that. So other flavors of Agile that are out there, uh, Agile Unified Process, Crystal Clear Method, Extreme Programming, Feature-driven programming, 
uh, rapid uh, application development, which I think has been around longer than Scrum. Um, some of these things have gone back to the government, and um, some I've, I've heard people use uh, NASA as an example. The space program it was basically agile because the president said we're going to the moon. That was the user story. <laughs> we're going to the moon. All right, NASA. And they were in a green field. <laughs> All right, uh, who likes who likes agile? The business likes agile uh, because of the cost. It's quick. You're quicker to productivity. Uh, the productivity is actually higher. There's been a lot of studies on that uh, because people are having fun. They're doing their thing. Uh, application developers like it because they have freedom and they have control. They're not being micromanaged a lot. Um, and they get to solve problems. Hackers. Hackers like Agile. Why? Because every two weeks I get another crack. And how many times do I have to be right? How many times do you have to be right? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, and then there's Ken's book. Talked about that a little bit. All right, so Scrum development is iter iterative, iterative, need some water, incremental, uh, in there's productivity, time to market, these are things that the business likes, customer satisfaction, overall quality. You come out of the gate with something already in place. And every Scrum sprint delivers you more functionality to something that's already there. You're not waiting for something to pop. Is always functioning while it's moving. Uh, the first project that I got involved with from a security perspective, I ran my first Scrum project directly out of Schwabler's book. I ran it in 2004. Okay, so it was new, and I was cutting edge. Okay, and I learned a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, when I first did it from a security perspective. I was brought into an organization, and they said, look, we have this Agile thing going on. You have some experience with Agile. You have experience with security. Can you help us out? This is the first time I had to deal with this. And they were doing a major implementation. So they had eight scrum teams. And they said, okay, you're Agile. You're security. Go ring these guys in. We have no idea what's going on over there. And they actually had a separate building. They had eight Scrum teams working simultaneously on different modules of an application. Okay. Um, I had over 9,000 user stories on day one that I had to review. Okay. Uh, so it's a moving train. So that's what makes it, and that's my point, is you basically get involved, and it's already a moving train. And that's one of the challenges. All right, so let me do, it's story time. I'm sorry? Now, does customer satisfaction quality improvement as well? Has your studies shown that? Yes, so actually, they're after it, I got to update another thing. Or is, is this little widget microservice somewhere ain't working? How about things seem to work less well? You know? Yeah, so there have been a lot of studies in regard to the productivity. Um, and I probably should have cited some, and I apologize for that. I should have actually brought out some of the studies that show that the productivity actually goes up higher. Um, uh, developer satisfaction, customer satisfaction uh, goes up. And when we're talking about the customer here, we're talking about the business unit. They like to see new, shiny things. Okay. All right. Not the end customer. When I go to my banking site and... And it's hosed? Yeah, that's not you. Okay. <laughs> Overall quality. And the reason it's overall quality is because in, in Waterfall, sometimes you get assigned a thing and you're building the thing. Okay? And you're dealing with a piece of it, and somebody else is dealing with another piece of it, and you really don't know if it integrates until testing. Okay? What Agile does is because you have teams, you're working on sprints, and hopefully you put them together in a related fashion, so you're all talking about something that's related when you do that particular sprint. So that helps with the integration. And uh, depending on how you run your, your Scrum, if you run pure Scrum, uh, there's no testing outside the team. If you do um, dual development, partner development, which means I'll develop some code, pass the computer to you. 
you develop some code, we pass the computer to me. And I'm checking you, you're checking me the whole way through. Okay? We test ourselves, and when it comes out of our team, it is done. Okay? That's one of the problems that comes out of being a Scrum Master because that's how they train you. We don't need to go to QA. What are you talking about? We did that. We're ready to go. We're switching on. Uh, a lot of people have gotten smart about that, a lot of organizations. I don't know of any actual organization that actually operates that way. At some point, somebody goes, okay, sanity check. We are going to do a test on this thing before it goes live. Um, but yeah, overall quality, again, that integration point's a sticking point, and you know, that stuff does come down with, with that job. Alright, so story time. I made another story of pigs and chickens. It's relevant later on, and I'll explain to you why. Alright, so the story is this. A chicken goes up to a pig on the farm and says, hey, we should start a restaurant. We'll make breakfast. And it will be ham and eggs. And the pig says, no, 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 no. And the chicken says, why not? And the pig looks at the chicken and says, because in the the making of a breakfast of ham and eggs, you're a participant. I'm committed. Okay? That's important because when we talk about the meetings, every meeting that they have, what they call ceremonies, you are a pig or a chicken. There are some meetings that you can watch, you can watch any meeting, but if you're a pig, you can say stuff at that meeting. If you're a chicken, you cannot speak at that meeting. Okay? And they're pretty strict about it. Alright, so this is your typical Scrum uh, roles. A product owner. So let me talk about what a product owner is. A product owner is the person who basically fills the product backlog. And we'll talk about what that is in a minute. They're responsible for asking the developers for a particular thing. They rank the importance of it. They are supposed to be from the business side. They're not necessarily technical people. Okay? That becomes important when we talk about, and I'm going to put this up here because I don't want to forget to hit this. Materiality and risk acceptance. Risk acceptance. <coughs> These are big. That's big. Because often, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but a lot of times you'll get a situation where you're reviewing a story and you're going to say, this is a huge risk. This is going to create a, a big risk to the organization. And the product owner, who might be a BA, business analyst, will say, ah, we'll accept the risk. Sorry, your butt can't cash that check. Because what you're basically saying, based on my risk analysis, is that if this thing is breached, it might bring down the entire organization for six months. I don't think you, Mr. BA or Ms. BA, have the authority to do that. And so you'll have to escalate. That's materiality. At what level do you have to escalate and get the appropriate approval? A scrum master. The scrum master is the gatekeeper. What the scrum master does is they're responsible for the daily stand-ups, which happen every day for 15 minutes. They're responsible to make sure that if the developers, if the team is being hung up by any problems at all, like the VMs weren't set up on time, or somebody's giving them a hard time over whatever, they are the person, along with the product owner, but ultimately they're responsible. You, Mr. or Ms. team member, go back to developing. I will fix this for you. All right, um, and so they're the they're that uh, they also keep the burn down charts and the tracking mechanisms, the Kanban uh, charts, and that sort of thing up to date. And they're a general cheerleader. The team members, uh, team members basically report to the scrum master. Now I hesitate to use the word report because teams are self organizing. In a purest fashion, they are self organizing. Basically, mean that 
basically means that we're sitting in this room, and I go, hey, you want to be on my team? You want to be on my team? You want to be on my team? Cool. Well, we're going to build this thing. And then we go off and we build that thing. Okay? As opposed to being assigned to build the thing. <coughs> so that's a loose. A lot of times the Scrum Master is also the developer. Um, whereas, like I said, the product owner. The product owner typically reports, because I did put on there that uh, uh, who they report to. They typically report to the business owner. A business owner may be the head of finance, uh, director of sales, uh, vice president of sales, whatever. Um, that's who they report to. And they do kind of a classical BA role. They get the information that people want. They enter it into a system. Sometimes it's JIRA, it's Rally. It's one of these other uh, applications where these stories go in to. They develop the user story. They get with the Scrum Master and the team members, and they decide when and where that needs to go in. They rank them. And then they basically assign them to particular sprints. And we're going to talk about that in a second, too. All right, so an epic. So we talked about stories. What an epic is, is a super story. Um, I, as this company, want a sales platform so that I can increase my sales or I can make it easier for my salespeople. There's going to be a lot of stories that are going to go up underneath that epic, but that's the big thing. That's the, uh, the, uh, the grand prize, if you will. So that's what everybody's shooting for. Who creates them? Uh, well, the business units create them. Uh, the business owner, along with the product owner, would create the epics. Uh, where are they kept? Again, they're kept in like Rally or some sort of application like Jira or something along those lines, which is also problematic because a lot of those applications now are software as a service, which means if you lose them, where's your architectural design? Someone else's. Exactly, somebody else's computer. Or what I've seen is, oh, the project's done, we're going to move to Jira, we're not going to migrate that stuff, we're just going to cancel our contract. And so we let the contract lapse. Then five years later, somebody says, hey, can we get the architectural designs for this organization and they, or this, this application? They go, cool. <laughs> um, what security should do with them? And we're going to talk about that a little bit because I'm going to suggest a couple new roles that you discuss with your organization. Um, but you should be, security should be involved at every level. And... Typically, you're not, and that's a problem. You might get the testing at the end. They'll say, oh, run some dynamic and static code analysis on the thing. Um, but that doesn't deal with insider issues. And so that's one of the bigger picture issues when I'm looking at my time, um, because I could talk about this for days. Uh, one of the bigger issues is, is there the potential for fraud? to go on in the development of this. So access control lists, ACLs, need to be reviewed and approved. That happens at the EPIC level, typically. Okay, you want this thing? You want this sales thing? Tell me who's going to access this sales thing. Tell me some of the basic permissions, roles that you're going to put into this thing and some of the permissions that they're going to have. And then, like Scrum, from a security perspective, that is a living document and it is continually reviewed. We'll talk about that. All right, so the story, which we talked about the format, there's books on stories, okay? And I'm going to also suggest a couple other stories that really are not part of the Scrum lexicon, if you will, right now, but I think should be. These are the ceremonies, release planning, sprint planning, the daily Scrum, the sprint review, and the sprint retrospective. Release planning is kind of where the epics are made. It's a little bit below, actually, where the epics are made. Um, but it is basically deciding over the next year, or six months, or whatever, what functionality you hope to release and ranking that. Sprint planning is actually saying, okay, you're sitting down with the team, and you're saying, 
uh, and the product owner, and you're having a conversation on what <coughs> functionality is going into this sprint. Okay, they play a game called uh, uh, actually I forget now. It's uh, uh, planning poker in t-shirt sizing, and they play these games where they basically take all the stories and they rank them by difficulty. And then they decide which ones, uh, a team of eight or five or however many you have, which ones of those can be dealt with in the next sprint. If it's a two-week sprint, four-week sprint, whatever the time frame is. Uh, the reason they do that is because, uh, and, and I've seen this happen, where somebody says, oh, I rank this one really high. This is going to be extremely difficult. And somebody sitting across the table goes, no, it's not. We just do this, that, and the other thing. And I go, oh, yeah, that would work. And so that's where some of that, uh, when we talked about uh, productivity, that's where the actual productivity happens because you start talking about it and go, oh, there's a simple way. Or we'll just bring in this, you know, uh, this binary and it will do it or whatever. <clears throat> so uh, the sprint planning, daily scrum happens every day. Daily scrum is 15 minutes long, period. Uh, I've seen people use an acoustic or something along those lines, or if you've ever, if you're a fan of Lord of the Flies, he's a conch. And you hold the conch, and no one's allowed to speak unless you're holding the conch, and you've got five minutes basically to lay out all your. There's a couple things they're going to ask you. One, what are you doing today? What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And are, are you experiencing any blockers? There's no discussion about those things. Those are the three questions. If there needs to be discussion, the scrum master will come and see you after the meeting to discuss the block because they are, it's their job to remove them. Your job is heads down coding. Sprint review, that happens after the sprint, and basically you sit down and go, okay, what went right, what went wrong, did we size these correctly, what nightmarish things came out of it, what functionality were we not able to, uh, uh, to produce. There's also a piece of this, an element of this, it's not in this part, but um, of a dog and pony show. This is where you basically present this, you show the business owner and the product owner the new functionality. And you get a yay or nay from them. And that's a big thing in Scrum, it's called the definition of done. And it's very important to get to the definition of done because otherwise the sprint gets blown. So I've been in uh, those type of meetings where they've sat down and the product owner went, what is this? Well, that's what you asked for. No, I didn't want a teal screen. I wanted a blue screen. Okay? Now you've got a problem. All right? Um, sprint retrospective, that's going back and basically looking at the entire sprint and saying, okay, what went right and what went wrong over the entire process. Did we have, now, what's supposed to happen there is did we have the right players around the table? And we have security because it might have been a security issue. <clears throat> and unfortunately, more often than not, the answer is no. More so now, though, it is coming around. Uh, so these are the artifacts that are produced, the product backlog, which we talked about, the sprint backlog, burn downs, which are basically charts that track their, uh, their traje trajectory, to actually completing the sprint. So basically you'll have the stories and you'll have this what they call burn down chart. It's an arrow that's basically going down. The idea is at the end of the sprint, when the sprint actually ends, you should be at the baseline. All work completed. <coughs> Scrum boards, uh, those come in lots of different flavors. The one that's most prevalent is the Kanban board. And basically what that is, is every story is written on a card and it moves its way across the physical board in slots, in development, in test, whatever, whatever those slots happen to be. And so they're visual, and the Scrum Master is responsible for those. i got to speed up a little bit. All right, so time boxes, the sprint, and right here we'll tell you kind of a general rule of thumb. If your sprint is two weeks long, your release planning should be a half a day long. Your sprint planning should be half a day long. Your scrum daily scrum meetings are 15 minutes long, regardless of how quick your sprints are. 
and your sprint review should be two hours long, and your sprint retrospective should be two hours long. They're really big on time, and one of the things where Scrum gets a little bit twisted in organizations when they start going off the rails, because remember, they're cutting edge. One of the first things that happens when Scrum breaks down, there is a hard and fast rule. No developer works more than 40 hours a week, period. Now, anybody on the Scrum team work more than 40 hours? Yes. And that's where Scrum starts to break down. You have to size your project and your stories to fit that 40-hour work week times eight people. All right. Uh, I can't remember. There's another, um, I think it's Rupp. They have a, um, another person that's basically part of the team. It's not really part of the team. Uh, and that person's official title was Batman. And, you know, whether, what that person does is when that starts to break down in 40 hours or whatever and stuff doesn't, you know, burn down chart isn't making it, you're not going to make your timeline blind or whatever, or you have a major issue, you call Batman. And Batman is the fixer. All right. So, uh, every time I deal with a scrum team, they go, give me a security checklist. So all you have to do is just give me a checklist, we'll build it to the checklist, and everything will be cool. And then when a breach happens, they go, well, if you gave us a checklist, we would have known that you weren't supposed to hard code that stuff in there, or leave passwords in the clear. No one told us not to. Um, so, here's my checklist. It involves security in every aspect of the SDLC. That's it. There's a checklist. Did you do it? Check mark, you're done. If you didn't do it, And I've seen this a million times, and that's basically like my spiel about uh, uh, at some point, you know, something's going to go wrong, and they're going to point to security and go, well, you didn't give us a checklist. Now, uh, to be fair, you could give them a checklist that's based on the policies and procedures of the organization or the standard builds that are there. All right, so this is the Scrum organization. This is a guesstimation. This is what I kind of envision, and this is the spot that I've kind of held in the past. So you have the scrum teams, and you have the product owner and the business owner. I have held this position in multiple organizations, and basically what that is is, is scrum security lead. And I've been involved with the project teams in building in scrum. This is a uh, team scrum member, or I'm sorry, team security member, part of the security team. All right kind of a liaison between the team and the SSL. But do you ever see the, that particular spot? Do you ever see them acting as a scrum master or a product owner? Or? Um, all right, so let me talk about the product owner a little bit differently, okay? Because ultimately, any risks that you find, any vulnerabilities that you find, if you follow, follow scrum verbatim, <coughs> is never their problem. It's a product owner's problem. Okay? So what you're getting from these people is a collection of stuff. By being embedded with these people and dealing with these people every day and attending the scrum meetings and stuff like that, uh, you find out a lot of stuff. You also develop a rapport with those people in the team. And it's not uncommon that after about three to four months or whatever, team members will start catching you in the cafeteria going, man, we're doing this thing. I don't like it. It's scaring me. They're trying to get this thing out, and they want to hard code in this, that, or the other thing. Okay? <clears throat> so you get a feel for it, and you hear it, you get your ear to the ground. This person uh, can also help you with developing that. Really, in my mind, the primary reason this person's here is to drive security standards within the team and develop and bring up people's education level on the team in regards to security and standards. <laughs> Okay, so you might hold a monthly training. You might, in the train, in the uh, Scrum retrospective, get with these people aside and say, "Okay, here's what we're happening. Here's what's happening in our organization. We are seeing attacks from X on Y. Is there something that we can do that we can go back to the product owner and say, hey, here's the risk.' And you know, here, here's the risk articulated. Can we get it in the backlog?" Okay, buy-in is big. We talked about buy-in over here. 
buying is big, this is how you get it. By involving the teams from the get-go in the security process and not being the outsider. Um, one of the tools that, uh, that uh, I use is a risk registry. Uh, the rules about the risk registry is absolutely anyone can enter a risk that they think they see. All right? There is, it's one of those things, there's no dumb questions. There's no bad risks. You put them all in. It's this person's responsibility to ferret them out and see if they're actual risks or if there's mitigating factors in play that these people might not be aware of because it's downstream. So the risk registry, any one of these people can put something on the risk registry. Hey, I don't like this one. I don't like the way this is going, I don't like the way this is happening. It could be done anonymously if they think that there's going to be some sort of retribution by talking to the SSL. The SSL reports to the CISO directly because ultimately we talked about materiality and how far up the chain you have to go to accept the risk. Uh, in the past, I've used sign-off authority. If your directors can sign off for $100,000 and my risk that I've identified is going to cost the company over $100,000 to remediate, you can't sign off on it if you're a missile director. It's got to go above you. All right, so we talked about escalation. That's what we were just talking about. Um, here's some security roles, the CISO, which is probably already there. Uh, these are the new ones, Scrum, security lead, Security team member. Uh, again, they drive the security. They they go from uh, basically, if, if you're familiar with how uh, training works, you start with awareness, you go to training, and then you go to education. Ultimately, that's what you're shooting for with your scrum teams. You want to bring them up to a level over time, a maturity level, where they're thinking about security all the time. Uh, okay, so that talks about the security lead. We talked about that a little bit. I'm trying to move along here. Uh, this is me as a security troll. Uh, they decided I wasn't a pig or a chicken, but I quite, uh, you know, excuse my vernacular, pissed them off to the point where I was a security troll. And so I dressed up as that for Halloween. <laughs> um, and, and I don't want to paint the picture that that was uh, a bad relationship. It was, it was funny. I had a lot of fun with those people. And because of that rapport, I was able to, to escalate a lot of uh, security issues and save that organization a lot of headaches. Um, risk registry, we talked about. Threat modeling should be done at every level. Risk uh, control matrix. These are things that are bigger than the team itself that they can't necessarily solve. They are pan-organizational issues that you have discovered by being involved with the team. All right, uh, Access control issues. Identity access management always falls into this uh, because scrum teams don't necessarily know how the business works and they'll give access. Well, he's a supervisor. He needs godlike access. No, no, depending on the business, maybe not. Uh, security stories. Security stories. I want to jump to that because that's important. Standard security stories. That's the stories that you write as a security professional that go into the backlog. You have a discussion with the product owner. You say, you have this risk. I need this story put forward. If the product owner doesn't buy along, you have to escalate. Or doesn't go along, you might need to escalate this issue, depending on how important or how bad you think the risk is. The security stories might be something like, I don't know, it could be in regard to auditing. Uh, as a security professional, I need to see logging events in the, in the sim so that I can monitor whatever. Limiting stories. These are taking a story that we basically have and limiting it. As a sales representative, I want to, I, I need to... Um, have access to all my sales data, but not anyone else's. So I've made a limiter. Functional caveats. Uh, those are in regard to, and I didn't have my notes on that because that's kind of a deeper subject and I'm not going to get too much into it. But functional caveats basically are stories of, that are limiting, but they're, you know, I should be able to do this and not that or we should be able to uh, log in using whatever, um, OAuth or whatever. Negative stories. 
Negative stories are the exact opposite. As a so-and-so, I should not be able to do this, ever. As a so-and-so, I must use a jump station to log in as admin. Okay? So those are negative stories. I hate to call them negative stories. They're really security stories, but they're kind of upside down. They're about not being able to do something. Where do you see vulnerability remediations going in that? All right, so vulnerabilities that are found in remediation basically go back to the SSL. They become part of the risk registry or the risk matrix, and they are addressed there. So by, who? by, review. <clears throat> by the scrum team. You go back to the product owner and say, hey, you got this thing, and this is how it has happened now. This is where I like the concept of Batman, because I don't have to rely so much on the product owner. I can sick Batman on it, fix that now. It's live, and we have a vulnerability. So if they actually open up an MBI or an MTI and then we'll prioritize it as a nice PI, what do you, what do you tell them? Because it's a vulnerability to remediate it. If you feel that there's a real issue yeah. and that the likelihood of this thing going bad is high, you have to ask them. You have to go above the product owner. In a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations think they own, or they do what they call an owner-owner model. Meaning, as the business owner, I own the entire stack. Okay, you're going to own it then. Then I'm going to have a discussion with you about the risks, and you're going to have to have a conversation with the CEO when everything goes up. All right. Um, logical diagrams. These are the things that you basically need to do your job. We talked about this. The uh, logical diagrams, the workflow stories, the trust boundaries, all the network interfaces, the APIs, the UIDs. The roles, all the application roles, all the network roles, data assets, data classification, potential vulnerabilities, list of potential actors. This is where your threat analysis comes in. This is where you're monitoring traffic. You're in touch with the knock, and you're seeing certain types of traffic, certain types of attacks that gets pulled into it. All right. Uh, and in an agile environment, these are the things that you're not going to get very readily. Weirdly enough, it's the same list. All right, uh, this is threat modeling. Uh, we're not going to get too much into this. This is uh, OWASP and Microsoft's version using Stride and Dread. Uh, this is basically making threat actors. I used my sons because they're delinquents. Um, but this is basically identifying the potential threat actors. This goes into your matrix or your, your threat analysis. Um, and again, that's an iterative thing. It starts at the beginning when you do planning. It continues to go through the sprints. Is this something that the security team leads? Yeah. Security team lead. Involve the teams in this when you do the retrospective and the planning. Okay? One of the best, you know, they like to play games. They like to play the, the poker game and stuff like that. This is a, this is Clue. If we had the system the way it is, who could attack us? Who would want to attack us? We're a bank, so anyone who wants money, so that's a thing. Um, how could they attack us? What skills would they need? What type of tools? And how could they attack your application? Get people on the team thinking about how to break it. And that's a threat tree. This is where you basically go through and say, hey, if I'm going to break this, what are the things in the application that that will get me to that break. And again, you involve the, the, the teams. Uh, these are resources, CPEC, CAPEC, CWEs. Uh, that's the risk, uh, risk, threat times vulnerability times consequence is risk. Embedded resources uh, for better integration. Be part of the culture. Have it fun because that's part of the reason we, uh, you have the uh, increase in productivity. Um, Threat modeling, continual threat modeling, ear to the ground approach, collect data from multiple sources, not just from your scrum teams, but also what's going on in the NOC, what type of things that they're seeing, what type of breaches are happening, and filter that into everything that you're doing in the risk registry and the uh, RCM, risk control matrix. Collect data from out, okay? Resolve issues in the same mechanism. So in other words, whenever possible, make a story, put it into the, the sprint, and, and work the system that way. Uh, and you know, make the product owner responsible for the risks. You know, they need to rank those things as well and put them in there. Continual testing. 
dynamics code, uh, code testing, dynamic <coughs> static, uh, penetration testing, continual education, and that leads to continual improvement, which is where this thing all started in the first place. Questions, comments, manifestos? I tried to run through this. What are other things that they So, um, story reviews, reviewing the stories, basically threat modeling the stories. Uh, I look at the story and I go, okay, how can I break that? What bad things could I do? A lot of that stuff is identity access management or roles creep. Um, because, again, the developers don't know the business. They don't know that accounts receivable people should never touch account payable stuff ever. So, the security person would know that. With dealing with the other results. So do those mitigations coming out of those, like when you do a threat model, do those become user stories? Those, yeah, exactly. So they, whenever possible, go back to being a user story. Um, so we talk about business owner now. What about rolling that up to the SLT and saying when they're creating their ethics, getting them in the role. So when you do the retrospective, that's when that stuff gets escalated. I have cards if you want. I'd really like to give these out to you. Uh, only, not because I want to promote myself, but there's an email at the bottom. If I miss anything that you want to talk about, let me know.